and welcome to Creative Conversations with Mary and Lisa. I'm Mary. And I'm Lisa. <laughs> we are childhood friends who've reconnected across continents to talk about the creative process. Lisa is in Germany, where among other important and uh, interesting things that she does, she is partner in Amphora Publishing. I'm in New Orleans, where I'm longtime uh, lesser known radio personality and actress, but uh, this was all Lisa's idea. And I want to thank you very much, Lisa, for, uh, for coming up with this, because it's been a lot of fun. And I think it's going to be a great adventure. So uh, our first awesome. guest today, <laughs> our first guest today, you can tell I'm a little nervous, but I'm excited because uh, we have a very special guest for our podcast today. She is award-winning writer scholar, PhD nonetheless, uh, former teacher, Erica Obey, whose book Dazzle Paint has just published. It is a fun, fantastical story filled with history, magic, history, intrigue, friendship, romance, and Celtic mythology. So Erica, congratulations, first of all, on the new book, and thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to go right into my first question, and that is, what is Dazzle Paint, and how did you pick that as the name for your book? Dazzle Paint is a kind of war camouflage that was very popular in both world wars. Um, it, I, its heyday was really the First World War, but it was used in the Second World War as well. And when you're dealing with camouflage, uh, the first idea with ships was that they would try to sort of disguise them as an island or a log. Now that can work with a canoe, for example, but this doesn't work when you've got a full battleship out there. So um, they did try to do it that way. And the first time, like put trees all over it and the boat never made it out of the, the harbor. Uh, the whole thing just toppled right over. So <laughs> after that, the whole point with Dazzle Paint, and you can see a nice example of it right there on the beautiful cover. Thank you, Christy. Um, the whole point of Dazzle Paint is you can see exactly what you're looking at. How do I put this exactly? You can see what you're looking at. You know you're looking at a ship, but you can't tell what you're seeing. You can't tell what the angles are. This was um, originally designed to sort of deflect radars and gunners. So they couldn't tell which direction it was going, how big it was. Um, I obviously see it as a metaphor for art and magic where you're looking at something, you know you're looking at something but you can't quite tell what you're looking at. I also think it's very beautiful. I mean, there are pictures of it. Um, it as far as I'm concerned, it's an art form in itself. And of course, women painted these, they're, they're wonderful pictures of female artists who had these little model boats that would do the design on the model. And then the men would go out there and actually you know, paint the, the ships themselves. I had an old Navy friend who would be cringing every time he hears me refer to a ship as a boat. So I apologize in advance, um, ships. <laughs> well, that, that is fascinating. That's gonna make me wanna go look up uh, you know, pictures and images of what uh, Dazzle Paint really is. But that's a, a cool name. Yeah, I, I thought as soon as I saw the name, I was like, wow, that is a really cool name. But what inspired you to write the book in, in the first place? I know it's part of your, your series, The Catskill Mysteries, but. Um, I live in a, uh, a, a utopian colony up here in Woodstock. It's called Birdcliff. Um, and Carrie's is modeled on it. All the other historical things in the book not all of them, but most of them are absolutely real. Uh, I didn't, I fictionalized Birdcliff because I'm very interested. It's a utopian artist colony. Now I'm getting all serious and preachy, but it's a utopian artist colony with servants' wings, uh, brotherhood of artists, servants' wings. Um, and John Dewey was here, um, the people from Hull House in Chicago, that's where they all met. I mean, these are people who really wanted to do some good for mankind. On the other hand, they are so, so deep in their class that they can't see the things they're not seeing. And I think that's very relevant to a lot of situations today. Um, partly, I just wanted to write about this place. Um, 
but partly it's much easier to try to talk about these things a hundred years ago, rather than trying to talk about them now. It's similar issues. You've got immigrant populations. You've got tremendous anti-Semitism starting up here in, in the Catskills. Um, the communists met here. The, uh, Woodstock was not on Hoover's radar because of Bob Dylan. It was on the, uh, it's been on Hoover's radar since 1920 because the big communist meetings were right up here in the Overlook Hotel where I have all those girls exercising. Um, so- Wait, Erica, wait, hold on. So many uh -huh. things here. The Overlook Hotel? Like- Okay, the, the other- the Overlook Hotel? Oh yeah, I know. I was like, the Shining Hotel? <laughs> the other Overlook, yes. Every oh, time okay. you, it was called the Overlook Hotel before Stephen King was a twinkle in his father's eye. Um, okay. It's one of the last old hotels up here, uh, one of the mountain houses. And it actually was the first hike I ever went on uh, where I slept outdoors overnight with my husband. Uh, I was sort of, you know, car camper girl. And um, what's sort of wonderful about this hike is the remains of the hotel are still up there. So it's just an old logging road you go up, um, but you get to the top and there is this beautiful wall full of empty windows and it's just people, there are pictures of it all over the internet. It's beautiful. Um, but the Catskill was full of mountain houses like this um, and Woodstock was full of mountain houses like this. Uh, there, there's really only one left around here, but um, Woodstock was a very conservative place until the artists showed up. But on the other hand, they were not averse to boarding out for summer boarders um, for you know, months at a time and making quite a nice profit on a working farm. Uh, business at Catskills has always been tourism, actually. So that sort of led you to, um... It just sort of lends itself to, to some writing about it, I guess. There's a lot. You, did you enjoy sort of, uh, you know, um, paying tribute to the, the community that you live in, in, in literary? I was nervous because <laughs> in some ways, I think this is why I fictionalized Bergcliff. Uh, in some ways, the people who were actually here were far worse than the people I painted. Um, they were horrible and indefensible anti-Semites. They just were. And, but on the other hand, um, there were some really real sins in my book that they are certainly not guilty of doing. And so I, I was very nervous about offending people because I've served on the board. Uh, the Birdcliff Colony still exists. It's still an artist residency's place. I like the people here. Um, and so I was nervous. I, I guess I was really nervous. I was even more nervous. Uh, Woodstock's a town with really, really long roots. We've lived here maybe 20 years now and people are beginning to think we're, we're, we're kind of locals now. But um, I was in absolute terror of, um, you know, somebody whose family has been here for ages going, Oh, no, 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 no. And I, I hired a fact checker. I also went to the Historical Society, but I hired a fact checker and she did. She had these books full of postcards and old photographs and um, all mistakes are still my own, but uh, it, it was pretty amazing. It was pretty terrifying. They knew like, oh no, that shop was here. It wasn't there, you know, uh, which is fun. I mean, you either love doing this or you don't love doing it. Um, and it was fun doing that. Wow, that sounds pretty challenging, but uh, really interesting information so far. And I'm not surprised because I know you're a wealth of it. Um, why don't we talk about magic for a little uh, little fun? You've got magic and fairies, which make your book really delightful to, uh, to read. But what made you want to incorporate this fantasy element into Dazzle Paint? Uh, a serious answer and a not so serious answer. Um, Birdcliff's a pretty liminal place. I, um, I've got neighbors who will unblinkingly tell you about the time they were abducted by aliens and lost time. And you just, hey, maybe they're right. Um, so there is just this atmosphere of it up here. Uh, 
we've also got some dedicated surrealists down the road, uh, who, uh, you know, and I love talking with them. Um, I'm sort of on the borderline. I don't disbelieve in fairies. Um, I believe in everything or I believe in, yeah, I believe in everything. Um, the serious answer again is this notion of displacement where I did want to talk about, you know, people who are in power and people who aren't Uh-oh. I think we lost her for just a minute, Mary. Can you still yeah. hear me? Yeah, we can have her pick it up from um, people who are in power. Back. There was a recent movie about, and actually a known, uh, a known actor in it. Was it one of these fringe films about soldiers, uh, uh, soldiers, and it, it, it wasn't it wasn't World War Two, but it, it mimicked re reality. It's like soldiers World War One, they occupy uh, uh, or enter into what is England. And and they take over basically they 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 treat fairies like the Jews were treated in World War One and World War Two, and I cannot for the life of me when she said that I realized I was in my mind conflating her book with that movie, and I can't for the life of me remember the name of that movie and I just saw it. Oh, is it the Secret Garden? The what is it? That sounds like the Secret Garden, maybe. Secret Garden. Let me see. Did it have a soldier and a blimp in it? I don't know about the blimp, but I think it had a soldier in it. Let's see. I no, these were older people. No, I just pulled that up. It's... Oh, but it looks like a good movie. I'm sorry I haven't seen that one, Mary. Oh, yeah, you would love that one. <laughs> I wonder what happened. Um, I sent her a Facebook message saying we lost you. You think she'll get that? Yeah, she'll pop back in. The other thing that I thought was really interesting, and I didn't even think about it, so I went on, I didn't, I'm only thinking about it now. So when she was talking about Celtic, uh, uh, believing in Celtic mythology or interested in Celtic mythology, the walk that I went on today here in Germany was um, looking at ancient German, well, this area, not Germany, but ancient, this area, Germany. Um, and we went to a Celtic burial mound. And uh, matter of fact, the Celts had a very strong presence here um, from like 2600 AD up through 700, uh, I'm sorry, not AD, <laughs> BCE, uh, up through about 700 BC. So pretty cool stuff, actually. Um, burial mound, they had the statues there. Um, and I've got to tell you, some of the woods in the Black, the, the black Forest itself I could totally see how people would start thinking about fairies. Absolutely, beyond a doubt, totally see that. Yeah. When the wind goes through the through the pine needles and the woods itself, or I don't know. There, I. It's hard to explain. It's hard to explain magic when you feel it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I love how she said, uh, "I believe in everything." That's awesome. She's really interesting. She's uh, she's um, flawed. She's uh, a scholar for sure. You know, like wow. Even though she had a PhD, I've known her now for four years, and I didn't know she had a PhD. Well, you know, when we had the little talk with Christy, that's how I knew that she mentioned it. Oh, I guess I didn't pay attention. I was so focused <laughs> on Christy. Set. Get excited about this, Christy. This wasn't going to happen, and she didn't. So there you go, and edit that yeah. part out. <laughs> Ah, right. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, Mary, that was a fantastic intro. Oh, she's back in the room. There you go. There we are. Hey, Erica. Welcome back. Okay, the fair folk would appreciate it if we move beyond that question, I guess. <laughs> I'm taking it as a sign. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot of wind and rain up here, uh, here in the country. Yeah, I was worried we were gonna have to deal with that because we've got rain coming here, but um, 
Well, yeah, we can edit that. That's interesting. I don't know if you want to finish. If you remember, you were talking about power. Um, but if you want, okay, to yes, I, I can move on. Yeah, try to retract to where you were, and we don't. It, we can make a joke about the fairy. Yeah, um, fairies. Yeah, it, there is this notion that there are people in power and people who are disenfranchised, people that are lesser, people that are more, and again. Okay, maybe I just bury my head in the sand, but I find it much easier to talk about this when you're talking about two courts of the fairy world than actually trying to sort out everything that's going on um, around us. Uh, and in legend, there are two courts of the fairy world. There's the Seelie court. Those are the sort of beautiful ones. Um, they call the gentry. Um, but they are every bit as dangerous and... Um, mean and unfair as the unseely court, which are all these sort of folk um, fairies like brownies, kelpies, you know, all the little monstery kind of fairies. And so it's not really the subtlest of analogies, I know, but um, on the other hand, I, it's much, much easier to talk about it in those terms uh, than talk about trying to sort out things in real life. Um, when you're so deep in the middle of them in particular. No, yeah, that's a very good answer. I, uh, you know, there's so much really cool history uh, in this book and that it's fun hearing you talk about it. One of the things that I wanted to hear you expound on is about settlement schools. I know, um, and, and their influence on progressivism in the 20th century. I, a lot of people probably don't even know about settlement schools. How did that? Well, um, the, the first, not the first major person, but the major figure in the settlement movement is Jane Hull, uh, Jane Adams of Hull House. And this was a school, and again, you're, you're always dealing with class. Um, this was a school where it, it's like the Fresh Air Fund today or something like that. They would go in and get kids out of the tenements. They would teach them to dance the Maypole and folk dance, you know. <laughs> Uh, but on the other hand, they teach them useful skills. Uh, and it was a way of trying to elevate them and educate them. And again, then you've got this whole issue of what is elevate and um, educate. Jane Addams never came to Birdcliff that we know, but her partner, Ellen Gates Starr did. And she was a bookbinder on top of being this kind of an educator. Uh, but you know, it. It is, it, it's always this thing where these people did a heck of a lot of good. They really did. And they were good people and they wanted to do well. But on the other hand, you know, you, you can sort of see them going, well, yes, you know, we'll train them up to be teachers or something suited to their class. Uh, another it sounded, sort of like, it sounded like they were victims of what they were trying to get rid of or guilty of what they were trying not to be, right? That they knew better, even though they were talking about being progressive and getting rid of those classes and class systems. Am I misunderstanding what you're saying? Um, you know, on the other hand, they gave these kids food, um, which was not, in, and, and socks. Um, I, it wasn't John Dooley. It was... Reese, he was another progressive. Did you know, is taking pictures of kids in the middle of winter with no shoes, no socks. I mean, they are doing this. They are trying to socially reform. Um, I don't really want to pick on them. And again, when you're too much inside or too much outside, I taught in the academy for years, uh, higher education. And you could sort of, hear people the same way, well-meaning. I once heard a lovely man, a, progress, a professor of theology, nice guy, say in all sincerity, well, sometimes I don't think people should be able to vote for their choices. And you're just like, woo, you know, <laughs> I mean, um, and, and so it is sort of this thing, I don't wanna pick on them, they did a lot of good. Uh, but on the other hand, I, again, I, it probably is reflecting my experience in higher education, where at a certain point, um, you know, 
the message was very much think for yourself as long as you think what we want you to think, kind of. Yeah. And that's, that's oversimplifying, but um, <laughs> again, too close to it. Yeah, it's really interesting that you chose, you know, this uh, Uber to, to address, you know, what you want to address. And um, wh what do you think essentially is important about this book? And who do you think it should read it? Like, you know, who did you write it for? Alas, me, I wrote it for me. You oh, know, I'm know. like one of those cranky writers <laughs> that writes the books I want to write. And it, it took me so long to get to this part place that I just, I write, I write the books I want to write and that's what I do. Um, <laughs> more seriously, uh, I, I like playing with genre. I don't, I mean, I'm deep into mystery writers of America right now, but um, I don't really consider myself a mystery writer except in the sense of mystery writ, uh, writ larger. Um, I, I like things that, that are half known, if that makes sense. And so I like this book where you can't exactly tell where things have happened and where things didn't. Um, I think anybody who lives in Woodstock should read it and anybody in the Hudson Valley. I don't know. I'm terrible at answering that question. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's that's a very honest answer. I like that. I know. I mean, you have, it's the third book in your Catskill Mystery Magic series, right? Um, that, well, uh, I, there are three historicals, yes. Um, but we did really. Planet Ride, Amper Eye. We did this one. Horseman's Word is also set up here, but less said the better about that experience. Uh, mm -hmm. Lazarus Vector was actually the first one Amper I took. Um, and uh, I think, oh, there is a very nice, I've got two nice books with nice covers, but not much going. My first one was Back to the Garden and that originally titled um, book, uh, everything in Woodstock's called Back to the Garden. Um, <laughs> that was sort of, I think I always write about texts. I postmodernism is a horrible thing, but I think I'm always trying to write about writing and stories, which is terrible. But you know, PhDs do something to you, uh, and so I usually come into this either hearing people's voices, uh, characters' voices, and rhetoric diction. And then there is usually some kind of um, genre rhetoric that I want to play with. Um, and, you know, that's my tragedy, I guess. But I think that's. Yeah. Mary, I want to jump. I'm sorry, go ahead, Mary. You, you said I, I lost the last bit of what you said. That's what, what? You. I guess I said that's my tragedy. I don't know. I mean, I think I'm over, overly intellectual and people keep asking me, is this literary fiction or genre fiction? And I keep grumbling, there is no difference. There are well-written books and not, not well-written books. So, um, Right, and what difference does it make? I mean, why do we have to do that? To th we always do that to things, you know, music and, you know, other, <laughs> other arts. We have to like, oh, what, you know, is this uh, soul or is it? R&B or is it hip hop or, you know, or the rap. It's like, I mean, I understand the, the differences between those, but with writing, I mean, I, it's fascinating to hear you talk about your process and, you know, um, it leads me to um, wonder what your relationship is like with your readers. Um, I don't know, Lisa, did you have something else that you wanted I to add? I did, and Mary, God knows, I, I loved you as a kid and I love you more as an adult because we just, there was synergy that just happened there. So oh, really when I, I, very close actually, because because Erica, what you said about you know writing for yourself, it, it I tell uh, new writers, you know they're all they start writing and then they realize every story's already been written and then they're like I can never write and then I'm like but nobody's written like you you're the only one that writes you the way that you're gonna write write for you just do that and they get this. I, I'm, I'm making some of this up, but many of them will go, ah, what? Okay, I can do that. But then as, 
as we talk through it, as I talk to other writers about the, the maturing process of a writer, that they said as they grow as a writer, they begin to see their audience and know their audience. The audience sees them. So they begin to write maybe not so much for their audience, but in a way that the audience expects. So I'm wondering if the full circle is you ultimately come back to writing for yourself. I always thought that the ultimate maturation was is that you become uh, such an experienced writer, the readers see your growth over time and, and you and your audience become um, not one, but you, I, I, you just, you know what to expect in a good way. So like Erica, is it, yeah. So what do you think? What do you think the art of maturing as a writer looks like? I, I think you're, you're, you're right. I, I always go back to Robert Frost's um, term, playing tennis with a net. I mean, if you say you're just writing for yourself, um, then great. There are a lot of people out here like that, you know, with manuscripts. Uh, you do want to put it out there for readers. And I think you also actually need to become a reader yourself and really look at what you've turned out. Um, you know, especially between like a second draft and a third draft. Um, and I guess I do use rules as genre at that point um, where you don't want the audience to see, you don't want to, that's sort of what you've said, you don't want the audience to wait and see what a staggering genius are. You also want to think about scaffolding it so that you are showing them what you're trying to do. And so I, I think it does come that way. Again, I guess I tend to think much more in terms of forms and genres than uh, people. That may be my problem too. But again, you know, I, and this is sort of the PhD happening. I learned to read and critique before I learned to write, though I did do an MFA too. I am just bristling with useless degrees. <laughs> I, uh, there was one other thing that I wanted to bring up. Um, and I don't know how far we should go with this, but I don't want to let it go. I've been having a hard time. Right, there's no right moment. I'm just going to throw it, throw it out there. So when you were talking about your inspiration, hearing voices, like we all do, I think, as writers. There was something in here. Um, actually, Mary, I just got noticed that we're getting ready to, the, the guides, the fairies have said that we are running out of time in this segment. Um, do you want to do a transition? Yeah, let's, um, let's do a transition. Um, we can come back and um, Maybe I'll ask that question about the relationship with the readers, and then you could we could lead into the one that you were headed towards. I, you know, I'm in terror of this question. I want to hear it. Oh, I know. The question I was getting ready to lead into, and we're going to get cut off in just a second, was, okay, so I had to look up pro progressivism. I was familiar with the term, but I wanted to go back and, and, and re-familiarize myself with the details. And I'm telling you, it sounds really like the recent... Um, it sounds like politics in the U.S. today. Um, and I was wondering if that wasn't in the back of your mind and how that might have informed your writing. And I was going to take that more into fantasy because fantasy is such, just like science fiction, is such a, both are such great genres for exploring crap that if you talked about it in the present day, everybody would lose their mind. But if you put it in fantasy or science fiction, you can actually look at the thing. Anyway, that's where I was going. About writing, like, um, you know, I'm curious about your relationship to your readers and, and how long it took you to write Dazzle Paint. Dazzle Paint was pretty quick as these things go. Uh, I think I had a pretty good idea what I wanted to do with that. Some, um, the one I'm wearing, I just sent to Amphora, that one I did three complete overhauls on. That one took a while because I was less clear what I wanted to do. I think with the historicals, by the time I got to Dazzle Paint, I had 
a pretty good idea of how this was going to work. So I won't say it was seamless or flawless. Uh, it probably took three or four drafts, but you need three or four drafts. But it wasn't, uh, Lazarus Vector took umpteen thousand drafts. Uh, you know, this it one- was I, a novel. What's that? It was complicated, so yeah. I am a complicated person. <laughs> you know, I'm always yeah. like, just take three ideas out, Eric, and save it for the next book. But uh, yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, this one actually went pretty quickly because I sort of had this down. Uh, Braddock Brides, I finally just said, I'm gonna sit down and write a stupid romance novel. I know I can do this. And Christy <laughs> laughed at me and said, you didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I uh, that one, I, and sort of, I got that down. I am sort of working on a historical now, but of course now I want two time frames because it would be too simple to just keep going the same old way. Uh, there's always gotta be something you're doing here. But, um, you know, Dazzle Paint was actually one of the easier ones to write, I think, um, as these things go. Probably got it done in less than a year or within a year. Your writers, I mean, your readers must be thrilled. You know, you work pretty fast. I, I hear you have another book that you're, it's already done that you're, I mean, it's- Oh not. yeah, I, I don't do anything. I garden, I hike, I write, that's kind of it. I, I read. <laughs> Yeah, like you said, you got to read to, uh... well, what made you want to become a writer in the first place? Did you always know you'd want to be a writer? No, I, I really didn't. I thought of all kinds of things. I never thought I was going to be a writer. And in retrospect, I'm like, yeah, but you sat around making up stories all the time. What did you think you were going to do? Um, but yes, I I have a degree in economics from Yale, which is, you know, uh, as I like to say, the ideal qualification for being a writer is discovering you really don't care about money. Um, but uh, I was going to, you know, be a serious member of society uh, and I couldn't do it. And I just started tech writing uh, because my husband was in computers and I don't know, I just sort of wandered into this whole thing. And all of a sudden it's like, yeah, this is all, all I've ever really wanted to do is sit around and make up stories. That is so funny. Lisa, didn't you used to do tech writing? I did. I actually yeah. started out my career as a tech writer. So I, uh, there's connections here. It's, it's, I'm just laughing about this. So I always wanted to be a writer. I did. And, and, and all the practical people around me were like, no. That's insane. Just, are you insane? And then, yep. so I didn't talk about writing anymore, but I went and I, I got an undergraduate degree in English. Are you insane? What can you do with that? At least, you know, not only did you go to Yale, you have a, you know, a degree in economics. Very practical thing. All my parents like, yeah, what the, what are you doing? I'm like, okay. And then I went on and got a, a, a master's in English, but that's, but that's where I did draw the line. You did go get an MFA, right, Erica? Yes. Uh, and a, um, uh, yeah, that's like one of those uh, stories uh, where, I mean, I'm a teacher's daughter. So when I finally decided I wanted to do this, I went to school and said, okay, uh, I'm going to do it this way. Um, and then about halfway through, uh, this was at City College. Um, I, Boy, I wonder if I'm going to get, I'm giving away secrets now. I said, I'm going to do something really practical and get the PhD, not this stupid writing degree. Wait, that's did you say practical and PhD in the same time? I, I, that's that's two that's words came out at the same time, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. But you're a teacher's daughter. It's so perfect, you know? Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, and then I sort of, this is the big secret. You don't have to broadcast this one or not. So I had moved the MA over to the PhD credits. And then I went back because I was then, I, and I sort of said, could I use the same literature courses to get the MFA as well? And this sleepy elderly professor 
you know, 900 years old who looks like he'd never seen a computer in his life, just picks up his head and goes, they're two different computer systems. And he puts it down. <laughs> Oh, she, he, he was a riot, uh, but yeah. And yes, practical PhD, practical writing. Yeah, typewriting is actually a job. Remember that? It is a job, and it, it's what got me through actually my master's program. I mean, it, it it got me, it kept me writing, it kept me employed. But but here's where we contrast. So you got your MFA. I'm laughing about this stuff. So I am many credits shy of an of an MFA. I took a number of classes. I went through the workshops, the murder, the murder workshops. What, what do we name them? Where they were just bloody. You'd come out crying. Uh, um, so I went through many of those. And my friends asked, they said, so why aren't you in the MFA program? And I said to them, as only um, an arrogant 20-something could possibly say, well, if I'm going to be a good writer, shouldn't I read somebody's good writing? Meaning... <laughs> that may be very popular with the MFA students. Yeah. Uh, so, did you feel like you got like the MFA did really help inform your writing? I'll circle it back to you. I made that way too long about me. Uh, no, I think I, I, I was just about to say this. I think there are problems with the MFA, um, which is uh, the way these workshops run. They are very geared to short stories with vivid prose, um, you know, because you're reading them out loud and you're, you've got to get it all over and done with, right, um, in one 30 minute class. Uh, so I think, you know, if you want to be James Joyce writing Dubliners, probably it works okay though, uh, you know, but it's very hard to learn to structure a novel through one of these. Uh, all right, and I actually, gotta interject. I gotta interject one more time. Oh my God, you hit it. You just, this circles, Mary, this, this circles all the way back to the beginning of this interview. When you were asked, when your readers asked you, do you write literary fiction or genre fiction? And in my head, the little voice in my head was going, well, literary fiction is the crap that some professor at college makes you read. And here you go bring a, the, the Dubliners, which is like, oh my God, why don't you throw Odysseus in there? Or the 17 other novels that dead white men, of, of dead white men that I had to read. Right. And what did the professors of your MFA program read? All of that. So the expectation is that's what they're looking for when you're going to your MFA. And I shouldn't be bashing MFAs, but that's, I just did, I guess. There you go. You know, they can be helpful. Um, workshops can be helpful. Um, you know, there's certainly also online workshops and mentoring that we do, you know, in the genre world in mysteries. And that can be sort of the other way, which is um, that you do get teachers who are very formulaic, who will say, um, if the body doesn't drop on the first chapter, I don't want to read it. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. They need to I, I mean, read As I Lay Dying. The body didn't drop for a while. <laughs> they forgot the bat. <laughs> well, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and now we're rambling a little far away, but this has always been something I've thought about dead white European males, the Dwems, um, is. On the one hand, I'm all for a very diverse curriculum. I taught great books for years. I could probably recite the Odyssey to you at this point. But on the other hand, the good thing about those books is it does at least teach you to read and engage with voices other than your own. All right, I'm on a rant now. But every time I hear a high school teacher say, or one of my students said when, uh, said to me, I don't find that relatable. I was like, that's not why it's on the syllabus. Um, this notion that you can only read books about people just like you. And that doesn't mean I don't think we should have a diverse syllabus, but reading great books is about learning to engage with people who don't think anything like you. And I think that's very important. Okay, I'm done preaching. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I love that. Pastor, the mother was a teacher, you know, <laughs> both sides. Like no. that. No, that really makes a lot of sense. That speaks, I think that speaks to everybody, you know. Um, and yeah, and this, this has been a really fascinating conversation to, to hear your evolution as a, you know, I think what informs a great writer is not that I'm, you know, I mean, I, I enjoy literature, but um, I enjoyed your book. It, I think what is, is knowing yourself and, and finding yourself and, and something that you said was so, I just love the fact that you said, I believe in everything, you know, because you have to, to, to be, you know, you can't be like, oh no, that's judgmental and it doesn't really take you anywhere, you know, in the, in the imagination. So, uh, but, you know, I, I just wanted to say that this has been a wonderful conversation. I've loved hearing you talk about your new book, Dazzle Paint, and I know that that one has just been published, but uh, now you have uh, given us a little hint that you have another book that will uh, be in the process. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all or what's next on the horizon for you. Um, well, we don't have a publication date that I know of. Um, but uh, yes, I'm working on something very different. Um, it's a cozy series about a female programmer and an AI bot that she is teaching to write mysteries. So yes, it's very postmodern and about, post um, about writing. On the other hand, it's a fair cozy mystery. It's called the Brooklyn North Murders and it's all about gentrification up here in the Hudson Valley. Uh, so that, that is the one I just finished and uh, sent off, uh, I guess, January or so. Uh, and now I'm sort of trying to cycle back to another historical to follow up with Dazzle Paint. This one's been very different. I guess you could call it a pandemic book because it's just very light, very fizzy. Um, you know, I've been reading a lot of Terry Pratchett and John Dixon Carr uh, these days. Um, I locked room mysteries and, uh, silly humor, I guess. I love the fact that your books, you know, you're like, oh, that's one is about gentrification and the one and Dazzle Paint, you talked about, you know, the whole dynamic, the social dynamic um, and the progressivism, you know, um, in there. And I wonder if, um, if you have, if your books are in schools, like for middle school kids or anything, because it sounds like it would be educational um, material for, younger kids to read? Um, they're in libraries. I don't know about schools. I'd love to. I think, I think Dazzle Paint would probably, I've been told I make my readers work too hard. Um, there's a lot of stuff in Dazzle Paint. I mean, I'd love to have Dazzle Paint in schools and I certainly think you should read it. But um, I know many of my beta readers sort of said, okay, and you expect me to know that and this and that. And I'm like, oh yeah, I do. You know, I keep trying to streamline things a little bit. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think, right. I think you might like in schools. They're fun. You say that last thing again? Uh, that's the new series is Watson and Doyle. She's named Mary Watson, the computer's named Doyle. And uh, um, that one, I think a kid could, nah, it's too complicated. I don't know. I think kids are underestimated a lot of times. My daughter went to a, um, a ma what do they call it? A magnet school, you know, for, for bright kids. And I still substitute teach over there. And those kids are so bright. You know, I was very good friends with the librarian and she was always trying to find them more and more, you know, stuff to, to feed their, their hunger for, you know, interesting books. And um, if you ever want me to come give a guest lecture on Dazzle Paint, I'm your girl. All right. That's awesome. I will take you up on that. I will talk to the people over at, uh, at Haynes Academy for Advanced Studies. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, I don't want to take any more of your time. It's been a wonderful treat talking to you today, Erica. And thank you so much for being with us. And good luck on Dazzle Paint and everything that is in your future. Thank you. I appreciate being here. And nice meeting you face to face, Lisa. Nice <laughs> meeting you, Erica. I was, this is a Thank you both. This was awesome. I have a huge smile on my face, so this is great. Yeah, me too. It's been a great creative conversation. I'm Mary, and that is Lisa, and our guest today was Erica Obey, and we thank everybody for listening and hope they'll join us again next time. Thanks, everybody.